Um, for any, for those who don't know me, um, my name's Bronwyn. Um, I'm, um, I have my own little company called Soul Solutions. I'm from Brisbane. I'm from Australia. Um, and I've been in the industry for longer than I haven't. So it just means I'm old. Um, but I've also done all sorts of things. So I've worked on small, small projects, big projects, small teams, just myself, big people, uh, big teams. I've um, I've done lots of different things over the years. So today, um, what I was going to talk to you about was different um, data architectures and, and data type problems. Um, we've got a nice small group, uh, so please feel free to ask questions as we go. Because I think you know we can have a bit more of a chat rather than just going through all the slides and, and stuff like that. And we can make it whatever it is that you're interested in as well, if that if that's what you're up for. So for me, over the years, I've found that I like, I, I've found lots of data. Uh, I found I like data, but you can, uh, you can go down these little paths and it's like a little bit of a maze. You find a bit of, a bit of data here, you find a bit of data there, you, you, you can cover lots and lots of different things. And then along the way, how do I deal with that data? How should I structure it? What architecture should I use? And like you'll trip over different philosophies you'll, and you'll, trying to work out what to do. So to get a bit of an idea of the audience we've got here, um, what do you, who here would consider themselves a developer? Most people, interesting. Uh, like a, what I used to call a DBA, but like a data platform couple, architects, report developers, no, not a lot. AI experts, no AI experts, interesting. Uh, managers, a couple of managers. Okay, we've got a bit of a mix, so this is gonna be interesting. Um, so I think I, I consider myself a bit of a generalist. I like a bit of everything. So I, I try not to like pick one label, but at heart, I really am a developer. So when I, um, when I thought about this presentation and who it was for, uh, if anyone went to the keynote this morning and listened to Scott Hanselman, um, because you're all here, I think I agree with him. Like you tend to be, you know, already in that top one percent. So maybe this isn't for you, and you may already know a bunch of this stuff. But it's how do you talk to the rest of your teams and other developers and other parts of the business about why some of these things are important and the problems that you could come across. And also, if any of it is new and different, that's an, also an extra bonus. Uh, so for me, this is going to be more a bit of like my developer skew on a bunch of these data problems. So I think it's safe to say these days that people consider data very, very valuable. Businesses recognize the value of having data, having good quality data, but what does that actually mean? What drives the value of data? I've got about four different principles here. The first one here is the ability to make good decisions informed by data. When I think about that statement, sometimes I also think maybe we want to know about bad decisions. Most, as most of us are, tend to be here developers, um, how many people have been asked by their manager to estimate how long something's going to take? Most of us, yep. And then, Who's been a bit hesitant in giving that number over? Couple. And who's ever been asked to, who's ever been asked to give them, just give it your best guess. Yep. And then how many of us have ever tried to give them our worst guess? Yeah, right? Because we want to pat it out. We want to make sure that we're not wrong. Same with decisions. You want to make good decisions, but sometimes you also want to know a bit of a padding to know what's the worst thing that could go wrong. There's nothing worse than getting up and giving someone the wrong information and looking really, really silly after the fact. And everyone really wants to avoid that. Um, and the good thing about decisions is we make them every day. Um, anyone want to guess how many decisions we, most people they say to make in a single day? No guesses? Thousands? So they say we make 35,000 decisions in a day, which is about one every couple of seconds. And alone, we make about 200 decisions about food. 
Um, and I think, you know, on events like this where, you know, you're not at home, um, maybe, maybe those decisions are more. It's like, should I have that extra bagel? Should I have the coffee? We make a lot of decisions. We want to make good decisions and we want to make them faster. When we want to have data, we need it at speed. So we need to be able to speed up the insights process to get decisions in a faster way because there's no point having the data if it's too late. And then each piece of data can be different. You don't want to know about the fact that the share market has crashed two days after the fact. You don't want to make the wrong investment decisions. Um, you don't want those async communications to be at the point where it's too late to know about it. Have, have you ever turned up to someone's door and you'd message them in, 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 the, in the meantime and they come downstairs, oh, how long have you been standing there? And be like, yeah, I sent you a like, text five minutes ago. And they're like, oh, I only just got it. Like, there's getting that data to the point that it is needed in the speed that's required. Now, each piece of data can be different. Some data, it's okay that it could take a week. It's okay that it could take a month. Other data is really important that you get it in a timely fashion. So you have to think about that, the speed that is important for the specific piece of information for the person that's presenting it. Once you've got it at speed, um, the important part is that you want people to have the confidence that the data is accurate and that it's trusted. There's no point getting it there quickly if it's wrong. Uh, if you've ever, usually when you, know, you meet a, a new person, like we tend to you know, implicitly trust that they're a good person. And once that trust is gone, it's hard to get back. Data is really similar. Um, has anyone ever uh, gone to a shop and expected that the inventory that they've ordered is there? And then like you turn up and it's not there and the guy goes, oh yeah, you never trust the inventory system. Like, or they'll say it's out of oh no, we'll definitely have one in the back. Like that data system to you then no longer trusted. You have to think about things like when is the data wrong? When is the data missing? And how old that data is. Um, I can give you like a slightly different example, like a not system, like not a system I worked on. So who here has ever bought a house or sold a car? Yep. Now, you usually fill out lots of forms. That's usually a fairly robust process and it usually works out except in a few extenuating circumstances. Um, so my example here is uh, sell, uh, transferring the ownership of a firearm. So in Australia that, you know, we don't have as many people holding guns. And when you have to transfer those firearms, you have to process it between someone who has a license to someone who has a license. Uh, so at a point in time, my father, he'd had, a, he'd had a gun license for a long time. We were transferring it to one of my friends so that he could take over it. Um, all good, we got out, you know, filled out the form, entered the license number, entered the details, did all the signing, sent it off to, you know, and then heard nothing for a bit. And then he rang me one day and he's like, Roman, just got this letter back from the police and they say that it's an unlisted illegal firearm. Like what the hell's going on? Like I like, and it's like listing fines. It's listing possible jail time. You know, when you don't deal with these things every day, like you get those letters and you're like, they're kind of scary. So I'm like, okay, well maybe we maybe we write the number down wrong. So I went back cause like you have to look at the little serial number. So I had a look, check the photo. Like, okay, I've got, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Yep, that's what I write down on the form. Okay, can't be that. Hmm. So then we had to work out the process of, hmm, what do they think the data is? So we went to them and got the list. So when you have your little card, you don't, it doesn't tell you what you, you have listed. So we got the list from them to tell them what we thought it, what they thought it was. And the serial number they had was really different. It was, uh, it had a couple of letters in the front and then four, five, oh, one, oh, two. And I'm like, that's a really weird number and then it twigged to me that that was my dad's date of birth so i assume back in the day when you know we first did this and you know this was 20 30 years ago when it first came in they probably didn't record that information and then somewhere along the line um they decided that was a mandatory field 
but they had to fill it with something. Um, so, yeah, to to because I knew his date of birth, straight away I was like, yeah, that's his date of birth and that's obviously what's wrong. Ring them up, talk to them like, oh, yeah, no, that's fine, you know. Um, that's just an automated email that we send out because it didn't match because we didn't have a person double check it and obviously that's been a rule that's been there a long time and, um, you know, scared us all for no reason. <laughs> but um, that was where the data, you couldn't trust it anymore. So um, don't know how many other people that applies to. Um, so the accuracy of data is really, really important because that's just a really simple example that didn't hurt anyone. But there's all sorts of other ones. So if you're saying like a, an important device is on when it's off and people do the wrong thing, um, and they think the data's correct, really bad things can happen. So confidence in your insights is very important. The last one I want to talk about is the empowering people in your organization. So you can have the best data platform in the world. It can have amazing data. It's accurate. You have lots of it. There's great insights. But if people don't know it's there, if people can't find it, if people have trouble getting access to it and there's a big process and then and they're afraid to use it it's also worthless um has anyone had lots of trouble getting like access forms filled out to get to things no couple everyone gets to their data really easily cool one problem you guys don't have to really so then we look at data platforms these are the next lot of principles I look at when I'm looking at doing re-architectures and applying different patterns because we, to me, I don't want to do that just for the sake of it. So data alone doesn't create value. Turning the data into actionable insights that empowers the users and makers creates value. So what does that mean? Um, a lot of people will hoard data. We've got lots of data. We can put it in lots of databases, we can have it there. But just because it's sitting there doesn't mean it's any good. Unlike, you know, gold, you know, we can put all that money there and that's okay. It can sit there and it's worth money. But data isn't valuable until you do something with it. You need to be able to put insights over it. So you need to be able to tell people about the data and they need to be able to do something with it. So there's no point telling people there's all this thing about your data if just sits there and no one does any, any actions. That's what dr is driving the value of your data. And my general rule of thumb for, for when I'm looking at any sort of re-architect or uh, refactoring is that you should aim for a like 10 time ROI through the either increased revenue or reduced expenditure. Sorry. Uh, the exceptions for, for me for that is a few things. One, um, there's some sort of legal requirement, so you know, new rules change. Uh, the platform that you're about, you have is old and there is some sort of reason, like there's a security vulnerability, there's end of support life, you have to re-architect. The other one may be what your definition of return on investment is. is are you looking at a short-term investment or are you looking at a long-term investment? So if you, for instance, were at Anders' talk uh, yesterday and he was talking about green power, um, maybe you're um, willing to make a, a concession on your ROI if you're looking at being able to be more healthy to the environment, for instance. So breaking down what that ROI is to your team can also include the guiding principles of your company as well. So when I bring that into one picture, we need to get our data into a place. We need to have insights over it. So you need to look at the quality, the consistency, what it is, what's wrong with it, or what it's telling us. We need to be able to give actions to people. So do they need to fix it? Do they need to go and do something in the business? Do they need to sell something? Do they need to buy something? Should they change the setting on something? something that they can specifically action. But then we also need to give that to the right people at speed. So if you give the data to everyone, no one becomes responsible. So it's looking at 
who is the right data owners or who are the people that need to be able to get access to this information and make those actions? Because sometimes having everyone responsible means that no one is responsible. So that's the, va like the value drivers and general principles I apply. So now I was going to take you through the general landscape overview of the different architectures that um, I'm going to talk about. So firstly, when I talk about architectures, these are the ones I think at the moment I would consider the key architecture players. First one is the database. Everyone familiar with database? Yes? You say that. Um, I was... Um, I was working with someone a while ago and they'd um, only sort of done API stuff and they were wondering why it wasn't working. They were getting weird data and I'm like, what's in your database? And they go, what, what's that? Because they'd only ever worked with like mocks and tests and they never actually looked at the real data level. So yeah, database. Um, the next one, uh, data warehouse. I'm going to cover data lake and lake house. That's what I consider the key players. And then the next one is what I kind of put into ecosystems. So data factory, so the work to get all that data into the place, into your warehouses and your lake houses and, and stuff. So your streaming hubs, so that could be, you know, bunches of IoT devices, video streaming, et cetera. Um, data meshes I am going to touch on. At the moment, I feel like it's still an ecosystem or a principle um, rather than a specific architecture. Um, the virtualization and federation, um, data governance is sort of like we touch on that at each of one of those and they become sort of more like really more important as we scale. And then of course a little bit about AI, AI co-pilots and sounds like this conference it's all about AI so or we can get we can delve into that a little bit and how you can use that. So when I want to look at comparing these different architectures, and you can apply the same principles into each level, um, and then it depending on how big or how, how big your database is and team is, it can change if you really want that architecture. They can be a, you can pretty much do any of these architectures on like a single database as well if you wanted to. So the metrics that I'm going to look at, um, so each one I've sort of gone through and given it a between a one and a 10, one being bad, and being good. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is speed. So when I talk about speed in this instance, it's going to be speed to an MVP, speed to get a new data set in. How quickly can you get a data set into your system? The complexity, so is it coupled? Does it have dependencies, etc.? Skills. So skills can be um, how many specialized people do you need? How big a team do you need? Do they need to do uh, more learning? Can the job be done by one person? Or are we looking at something where we're starting to um, need specialized tooling? Um, the next one is cost. And again, this is all sorts of different costs. So it could be the cost to have your team, the cost to run the infrastructure, the cost to the business to um, for downtime, the cost to the, on the latency, all the different costs that happen in a business. It could be the long-term costs to your company, to your country, to the planet, um, depending on what the principles are for your, for your business. Uh, the ability to scale. So how big, how, how massive, how easy it is to make this bigger. Uh, latency, and this, this is the one I uh, struggled with flipping the numbers on. So normally you want a low late, like a low number to be good for latency. So um, when I say uh, I'm going to flip the number here, so we're always dealing on a one to ten scale. So when I say latency is ten or a one, it's the opposite to what you would normally think, just for simplicity. And the last one is AI integration. So uh, this one I think is the one that's probably most up for debate, depending on where you are. Uh, and you can, I think we've seen over the week that we can sprinkle a little bit of AI into everywhere. When I'm talking about AI integration here, it's like really getting into that, making really interesting um, decisions and improvements using AI. So we'll start with um, introducing you to um, Danielle here. So Danielle, She's uh, come along to a system that has been around for a long time. It's a system 
where the database is over 20 years old. How many people here have worked on a database that's been living at least five? Yep, keep your hand up if it's been, been around at least 10. 15, 20, over 20, and some, yeah, so databases have been living a long time. And then for the people that have had it over five, how many UI changes, like how many UI rewrites have you seen in that time? More than one? Yeah. So quite a lot of the time, a database will outlive many, many, many UI rewrites. And what we'll have seen over that time um, and I think these legacy databases can be a really interesting um, view onto how the world has changed. We, we can see how that data changes. Um, if you've ever seen an old database, you will have like seen a bunch of fields and then, then someone did a really good job. Uh, so in this case, they, they started well, they set up the in indexes really great. It was running really well over the years. You know, we've added a field about this thing. We've added a field about that other thing. Fields keep getting longer, the data, changes this other field not used so much. Uh, I think one of the ones I've definitely seen over the years, and this will show how old I am, um, pre uh, having ABNs in GST, companies had ACNs. Now we tend to have both ACN and ABN. The, um, the older systems, a lot of the time people would, like for their searches, they were looking up by a company number. So a lot of the time, someone had done a really good job of like perfecting the index to search on ACN and then they kind of forgot about it. And now, pretty much everyone has to have an ABN. Uh, so a lot of the time, these searches don't work as well because no one's gone back and re-looked at those, re-indexed, improved the database. So Danielle here on her system, so they started out as a fictitious company. So they, they, they're dealing with rental cars. So it's been a little mum and pop shop for a, a few years. They've been capturing data. It started to started to drift and she's come in and she started to do some of the work to improve that. So she's working on sort of the basics, right? So this is pretty much the most basic app other than maybe it's like something like a low code, no code, but this is an app that is fairly basic that everyone has probably written if you're a developer in this room. Um, a web application with some business logic talking to a database. So she's got that working really, really well. But generally, these days, we've moved on and we tend to like not stay there for very long. We end up needing more. I think this is probably more representative of a decent system you end up having some sort of ingestion from some sort of other system. So this is what I'm going to consider the baselines for when I'm looking at these metrics. So um, let's go back quickly so you can see the numbers. So we had speed, complexity, skills, cost, scale, latency, and AI integration. So for this one, uh, when we're at this level, at this point in time, speed is an eight. Like at this level, you don't get stuff mu out much quicker than having complete control of your system. Um, generally, your complexity is quite low because you've got your system, you've got a database, and you might be importing someone's data. Um, skills are fairly, fairly low bar. So a lot of the time, all of this can be done by one person uh, without any particular specialist skills. At this point, it should be cheap. Um, if uh, your database should be the cheapest option at this point, like you don't have a lot of complexity in the, in the architecture that you need. Your scalability um, in comparison to massive data is, um, is low. You can get a lot of stuff out of a database. But at this point, your scalability in, in, in the scheme of things is low. Um, your latency should be, should be fairly good. So you should be able to get the data in and out quickly. And in terms of big AI type impact, probably low. Like you can do lots of little things. You can, you know, you might start experimenting with vectorizing some of your like comments or something like that. But at this point, you're not doing a massive AI project that's going to deliver lots and lots of value. And that's a little bit of summary there, because I know like some people have different interests in each section. And that's where I came up with them. So for you, like I went through a bunch of these with lots of people I know and everyone had slightly different numbers. 
this is how I sort of like start to break it down when I'm looking at architecture. So your number might be slightly different because you might have like for a database where you can get a lot of um, different options, you might tweak these to what you think and then think about it of how you're going to move it before you do that. And I wanted to spend a bit of time on the database because I think this is where a lot of people tend to try and rush away from. And I think if you're in the keynote this morning, again, like I think um, people rush to do things and unnecessarily, um, sometimes we might call it resume driven development. Uh, we've seen the latest pattern and we want to do that and it's fun and it's something new, but you can get a lot, a lot of performance out of just a normal database without having to go and do a really complicated architecture. Um, an example would be, and Danielle's gone to the water cooler and she's talked to Tim and he works, uh, so he, he works in maintenance and he has a lot of interesting information about the rental cars that she might be interested in. Now, a lot of people at this point would be heading straight towards a data warehouse, but when you just, it's you and Tim, at this point, what's the harm in importing that straight into your database? It gets rid of a lot of problems. Um, at this point, Tim's just telling you he has some data. How useful is that to you? Um, he's gone back. Yep, I've got data. I can get it out. Okay, have you got an API? Oh, you can go talk to that tech team. What, 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 what is generally the common denominator that we end up with a lot of the time when we talk to other teams about getting their data? Security? How about formats? What's the, what's, what's the biggest hammer everyone has? Excel? Yeah, so a lot of the time we might get an Excel file. Um, so first time you get it from Tim, you do your custom thing, you import it, it works great. Second time you get it, works great, happy. And a lot of the time, if we even put that into a warehouse, um, then our ability to change is less. Third time you get it from Tim, it fails. Um, hmm, it's changed. There's like the, the the columns are different. What's happened here? Well, you know. Um, Mary, she used to grab the spreadsheet and she'd add a few columns and tweak a few things so it looked a bit better. Oh, and Mary's away. You had someone fiddling with the data in between you weren't getting a raw source. Fortunately, because we have lots of access to the database and the application and we have that speed, we can go and readapt and go back to the like most pure form of the spreadsheet. Please don't interfere with it. Get that, get that going before we go to the warehouse. So you can get those processes going um, really quickly and get lots and lots of value by adding it to your own data sets at this point without having to go to a more complicated architecture. Um, if you were just in Dennis's talk about um, legacy code, I find um, some of the data, like I apply some of the same data principles. So he, he was fine with copy pasting code. I'm kind of similar with data as well. Um, when I'm importing a custom data set, if I'm the first one, it's okay. If someone else from the business wants it for the second time, it's okay. But maybe by the third time, maybe that's when we might need to look at a different architecture because you may be doing something very different with that data set to someone else. So rushing to put a data set into a warehouse just because someone else might use it can sometimes give you a lot more problems. So, these two teams have been working together for a while now. We've got a few data sets going. We've got some interesting information. So, you know, we've got our rental database, uh, rental car database working really well. And now, because we know the maintenance data, we know that this car's scheduled for a particular service. So we can be a little bit more confident about when we can rent out the cars. Now along came Sheila, and she is a reporter. She does, she's into reporting. She's like, I'm a really good Power BI developer and your data is really interesting and I think it'd be really interesting to report that to other areas of the business. So at this point, this is where we start to, to get a little bit more, bit more interesting and you found a few other departments as well. So at this point, this is where we start having lots of data that we're importing. We may have different databases um, we may have a lot of other telemetry information. So she's also discovered that we have a, a, a log file and some um, data files about telemetry on the, on the car. So you know where the rental cars are. You know that oh, this person's meant to give it back today, but they're over the other side of the country. Um, 
So we have all sorts of structured data here. And at this point, this is, might be where we decide to do the data warehouse. And then we tend to stick our reporting database off that. Now, I'm not talking about the easy reports that you could just you know, put in a little grid or put a few charts on using a third-party component on a web app. This is where you want to start doing a lot more customization. Um, so then you've got your little web app. It talks about warehouse possibly as well, or you could go straight to data, and then she's got a reporting interface. This is where some of your data cleansing can get really important. Um, I've seen um, quite often the, the bad pattern that the report writer they'll get a, a data set and they will start to fix errors in the database for us. So, yes? No stupid questions. Okay, so it depends. And I know you're going to love that answer. So a data warehouse is, is can be just is essentially a big database, right? So when I consider it becomes a data warehouse is when you're not doing any transactional information on it and you're doing multiple data sets. So you can do a warehouse pattern on a, on a, on a database and it can be mixed in with your stuff, um, but you don't want people doing your read, uh, like your inserts, edits, and deletes onto it. It's generally a replicated copy in a transform. So, and the next slide, I'll, I'll go into that a little bit. Um, so the warehouse pattern is where you start, and you, you generally want a, quite a few data sets at that point. Again, you can do it like um, I've seen, I've, and I've done it myself. You can you know, have your own schema where you've imported um, external sources into your own system. But when you're promoting that back up to the rest of the, the company and you're starting to expose that, that's where the, the warehouse becomes a little bit more um, obvious. So here, yes. It can have time dimensions, yeah. So a lot of the time here, you'll have the current data, you might have time series data, you might do time series snapshots. Um, and at this point, you tend to do a lot of transformations. So, um, and this is why, uh, this one's gonna work for me. This one here, this is why I put this one up to it. So before we had a four, now we go to a five, because at this point, uh, it's the next level of being able to do schema optimization. So in a database, you might have gone for like optimal normal form. In here, you tend to like a lot of the time, you'll start to flatten the data out because you don't want to do joins. You might want to do different um, essentially materialized views on data so that people can, a lot of the time you'll do it for reporting to make it easy for them. Um, and you'll take out bits of data that you don't want them to know anything about. Um, at this point, the data quality can be really important because uh, you don't want to start reporting on things that are incorrect. So identifying that information is super important. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so here generally like your speed, your speed has gone down a little. I'll go to the next slide because that's a better summary for you. Um, here, uh, based on our previous baseline, database to data warehouse, we've ended up, we've added a little bit of complexity because you're going for an extra step. You're generally integrating data with other teams and you can't just go and change it on them. Um, you, you, your complexity has risen because there's more, there's more parts to your architecture, there's more things to deploy to, there's more people. You generally need a little bit more skill than a basic Let's knock up any old schema. It doesn't matter how bad it is, because uh, you need to think a little bit about how that information is presented. You, your costs are going to go up a little bit because you've gone from a single database, which is prof, you know usually the cheapest thing you can have. This is generally much bigger, lots more backups, much more replication, possibly. Your ability to scale um, here is good, but um, it's still not suitable for like petabytes of data, um, depending on what your application is. Uh, and then um, your latency can be down a little bit because you've got an extra hop. And then here is where you, like, you can start to see a little bit more potential for AI because in your warehouse, that is the point where you're starting to usually integrate multiple different data sets from different parts of the business. I have. Yep, cool. So at this point, we've essentially got this little like team. So each of these people, I mean, you know, I'm talking about them as a single persona, but each of these people can be whole teams themselves. This team's going along well. 
they are finding different data sets and they're improving like the rental car company every day. Then generally what happens is we get things that aren't structured. So we had our database, we had some data files, but then we get other things that we need to import into our system. So this is a, the data lake. So we want to ingest into your data lake so we can support non-structured data as well. But then uh, this pattern, if I was starting like from scratch today, I would skip over um, if I had my choice because this one, we sort of end up in the boat, end, end up in worst of both worlds because we end up generally still needing our data warehouse because we, uh, we need to have our reporting and it, ne it generally needs a nice structure to it. So this is where um, you've made an architectural jump and you end up costing yourself um, a lot more money. So this is the pattern. Um, it was very popular. And now I think now that I'll skip this, I'll show you some of the numbers. It's significantly more complex because now we've got extra, like we've essentially got two architectures going there. Um, you've introduced a lot more complexity with the lake. Um, to do that lake pattern, you need a lot, like you're adding skill, you're adding people, uh, you're adding time, and then you're generally having more and more copies of the data. Um, it is uh, better for uh, for scale, allows some massive, massive like historical data and stuff as well. But it's generally the worst performing pattern in terms of time to deliver because you've got like the multiple sections that you have to do in significant latency. At this point is we usually where you start to talk to your data scientists. Like this is where they sort of come into the picture. But um, I'll add I'll add our data scientists in a minute. So instead, if I was studying today on this pattern, I would go straight to a lake house. So it takes the both of those patterns and essentially combines them together so that you can serve like your, your ETL pattern into here and have your data lake storage and report off it as well without having those those two whole sets. Um, it ends it it ends up similarly. Um, Similarly, like cost-wise, I find it tends up to be the same. Um, but then I also find that your um, complexity reduces because you've actually reduced the number of things that you're deploying. Uh, and then it adds all the streaming support and stuff like that that you, you're going to want at that point. Once you get to this level, um, your things like your, your, your data governance become really important. Um, thinking about what people are allowed to look at should they be able to look at what needs to be taken away, what should be shown to teams, um, how often each piece of data needs to be represented and how often each piece needs to be updated because what was okay for your application now on like a more company scale may not uh, apply anymore. So if we think about our team, our like data scientist has come along and he's seen that you've got all of this data now and he thinks he can look at things like when you've got the car out, your maintenance schedule, um, how old the car is, what's the price of like cars at the moment, uh, you've got all your streaming data going so you know where they are. So he thinks that he can make a really good model and help you optimize even further using AI and to work out when the what sort of inventory to hold? How, how are you okay to like rent out that car to people? Um, you'll see this if you I don't know how many rental cars you do, but uh, my my hack used to be to always order like the cheapest possible rental car, like the little like three seater because that one no one's ever going to turn down an upgrade, and you'll quite often get a nicer car because they optimize for the fact that you know people will not mind getting upgraded. Um, so this is when you start to apply those patterns at scale. Again, this is where you've got that little team going. So then what happens generally, I found in the in the in the scale type thing is you're doing really well and everyone like if you, you've done well, you're kicking your goals, you've got the cost down, you know, you're making more money out of the rental car business. Then what happens is everyone else hears about it. So then this is the other team. They've decided that's a really good idea and they want a piece of the action. The problem is this team, it deals with different data. So this might be 
you know, finance, it might be HR, they have very different requirements and abilities. So they may not be able to release the information due to speed, the type of data they have. They may have much more private information that they need to really think about harder what should go out. They may be the ones that have all the credit card information and, and finance history of the people that are renting your cars. So they're on a different scale to you, but you don't want to have to imp, imp, like impact your own. So you end up back at that thinking about the whole monolith. Like monolith can be good until you end up at the point we've got teams with very conflicting um, release schedules. So at this point, this is when I like, and generally this is where you have a lot of data. Um, this is where you want to look at maybe doing something like a lake house mesh. Um, and for like the easier thing I can think about to relate it to would be microservices. So as a developer, you, want, you may want to do microservices. Your data can be similar. So you can have your separate lake houses and work out how to store data, share data between them, but segment them so you don't have to do a big bang deployment. If someone changes one thing, everyone doesn't have to have it. So at this point, um, yeah, our coordination becomes high. Our expertise, yes, sorry. Lake House Mesh, uh, on this one? Yep. Oh yeah, sorry, I'll go through that down here. Yeah, so yeah, we still had all our data. Now, um, I was trying to make the diagram simple, so I was trying to get a few less, uh, few less lines. So um, there could be lots of these. So you have all sorts of different data files um, and, and objects coming in. Um, then you can have multiple lake houses. And then I've only done one of these lines, but you could have these off, you can decide. So you can have them off one or you could have them off each. So if you, you could decide um, you only want to have one reporting, but you could also have three different little lake houses that did reporting if you wanted to. Uh, you have your data science and machine learning as well. And then you can decide if there's one for the company, if there's one for each section, how do you want to segment it? Do you want like a particular one for HR and finance data or something that's more sensitive? Or, or do you have a generic one that the company has? And then this is where you really need to think about the data and who sees it and how often it needs to be updated. So this is, um, you can have as many of these as you want and they can talk to each other. So yeah, generally at this point, you're, you're using a bunch of the tools, right? So you might be using a Databricks or a Fabric or a, a Redshift and stuff like that to help you because it's at that scale and they will help you detect a bunch of the information. And, and this is where you need to think about like the costs of those architectures as well. So um, it's that trade-off. So if you think about the Redshift on investment, how many of them do you need? What can you get away with and what can you reduce? Yeah, yeah. And what is your 10x? Like, it, like you know, if, you, if you're going to make, you know, $10 million, it's fine to spend a million dollars on architecture, right? But if you're going to only make like a million dollars or $100,000, like you need to make your architecture smaller, otherwise you're going to go broke pretty quickly. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, yeah, and then at this point, because you've got all this data, like we're talking massive amounts of data here. So at this point, in theory, you should be able to do lots of really, really interesting things with AI. So you could be importing data from, a lot of the time you're importing bought data, right? So you might be getting weather data, you might be getting trading data, you might be getting all sorts of data sets that you buy as well as your own, own data to help you do models to improve your company. So then it depends how you want to segment up your, your team. So before we had a little team, or you may have um, the reporting people with the data scientists, you might have the users, you might have the developers, or you could have them segmented however you want. So that is where you need to really think about it at scale. So you really need good processes for that at this point. So when doing these sorts of things, uh, these are some of the my guiding principles are the key factors to consider. And I think, you know, I think we've sort of touched on them with some of the questions. So I like to start simple. So 
architectures can evolve. So don't be afraid to use something simple and try it there. So e.g., if you're going to get a new data set, um, you don't have to start by importing it into your data warehouse. You can import it into your database and make sure it's right and it's going to work because you don't want to spin up a bunch of this stuff and work out that you just spent all night processing it and it's not the right format. Um, a lot of the time, um, we can be lazy and um, re-import stuff because it's easier than um, keeping it. Has anyone, I don't know if anyone else does this, since you've got streaming services, does anyone um, watch it on the streaming service rather than go and get the Blu-ray off the shelf? Yeah. Um, that's pretty bad, right? Because we're like incurring a cost to stream that data when it's just sitting on our shelf. It'd be much cheaper to run it by grabbing it off the shelf in your Blu-ray player. Similarly, like for some of these data things, a lot I've seen a lot of people that will just re-import it because it's easier than dealing with like differences and stuff like that. I will just re-import it. They don't think about the costs of how much Azure time is running, um, how much you know CPU that is, how many like what's the CO two output of that. When they have it at hand, they they've just been used to being able to have it on on hand and scaling it up by tweaking that button in Azure. So start simple, and you can evolve. And um, it allows you to play a little bit more as well and see what works and fail fast. Cloud, it can be really cost effective. It also can be really expensive if you don't get your costs under control. Um, how many people here, and this is an interesting experiment, how many people have access to the detailed costing on the stuff they're using in Azure on every environment? Oh, that's good. About half. Yeah. Um, I've definitely seen in a lot of projects that they will might let you see your dev costs, but they will not let you see the costs incurred at the production level. And they may not, and if they do, they might let you see it at the subscription level. And if you've got a lot of stuff running, it's really easy to miss in that um, in that detail that you've done something silly, like you're importing something twice, or you, you've just done something that's incurring a cost, you're running at the wrong time of day and blow your costs out, and in the big sum of the Azure cost for the company, it's a blip, but for your budget, it's gone. So if you can get really good tagging and cost analysis and break it down and be able to monitor that, like, again, we come back to good data. It's not just good data for your users. Like, it's not just the data in your database. It's good data from your systems to know if it's the right decision being made. Because we, we sometimes guess, and they'll go, oh, go back and look at the Azure calculator. Well, that's great, but in practice, what is it actually costing me? Um, latency is a killer. So yeah, people love data and they love it in one place, but not if it's out of date. And the thing I like to use as analogy for that is the tabloids. If you pick up a tabloid paper, most of the time, those photos, they're not a really great photo. They tend to be blurry. They tend to be non-flattering. But what is really important about that photo is it was the first photo. It was fast, and it showed the message that was important. If you're the second person, you wait for that celebrity to like do their hair and be in a better position for the shot, someone's already got the money shot. Someone's already gone to print before you. Think about that when you're thinking about your data. So if, if you wait and spend too long doing it, someone else is going to get that insight before you. And with new data sets, aim to deliver within months. And AI technology is going to re revolutionize this, I think, as well. It's going to help us. So if you're thinking about a data platform and it's going to take you five years to get it out the door, it's too late. Think about ways that you can do little MVPs, do little tests, test this with your users, see what's wrong with it, see what needs to be improved, and get, get data sets that are out there within months rather than years. And prepare to change. Architectures involved. So make it so that you can easily switch or tolerant to switching. Copying data isn't a bad thing if it means that you can keep evolving. So to summarize, um, your ability to deliver quickly for businesses will provide ROI. As I just said, don't take three years to develop a complex data platform. Otherwise, it's going to be outdated. For me, don't be afraid of the monolith. Um, it's OK to 
to start with a single database. Um, I know Monolith for a while got like a really bad rap. Um, keeping things simple can actually make things more efficient. Uh, technologies evolve and you don't need to aim for the most complex thing if they're not needed. Um, I think, again, if you look back at um, Scott Hansman's keynote this morning, he showed like running a much simpler language model. Um, why use something that can answer every question in the world when you're just after, you know, a taco recipe or you just want to know how to code? You don't need a data platform or a massive API that no one's going to use if really what you want to know is how old this person is. Um, low, low latency is definitely the killer for adapting to, to develop platforms. No one wants to wait for it. If you, you can't deliver the data in the time that they need it in an insight, then generally it's not worth it to them. Um, cloud enables us, um, can enable us at low costs. Turn that on at day one, get your monitoring going, look at your logging, um, get that under control and work out where you can improve things because getting your costs down um, will help with your ROI. And then I think, if anything summarizes the last three days in the sessions I've sat in, I think um, AI is going to revolutionize the way we access and manage data and make decisions. Um, and it's a catalyst to invest in getting your data right. Um, if you looked at any of like the AI topics, like I think this is very important. So, you know, we're looking at bias, we're looking at data accuracy. Um, if you don't have those things right, building AI on top of them, you're going to get the wrong answers. So just to close, just thank you again for coming along. Um, you can find me, I have a fairly unique name. Um, you can find me on most platforms at Bromin Z or just looking up my, my name. Um, did anyone have any other questions? Yes. Sorry, can you say that again? I got the lamb a bit. <laughs> Um, I haven't, so the question, sorry, I'll repeat the question. Um, the Lambda versus Kappa architectures and have I seen people moving to Kappa? Yeah, um, I have, I haven't, but I tend to, and to be transparent, I tend to sit more in the Microsoft stack. So I've seen a lot of people using like the, like the Databricks and the Fabrics and stuff like that. Um, yeah. In the, in the ecosystem I'm generally in, not as much, but yeah, and I assume like generally people stay in, yeah. Yeah. Michael Hill, yeah, Michael Hill. Yeah, but have you seen them shift? Like, have you seen them shift? Yeah, good. Good. Cool. That's good to know. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. So for the recording uh, as well, for everyone else, uh, so the question, and correct me if I'm rephrasing it incorrectly, so you want to know about the hype, like what my thoughts on the hype cycle and where data mesh is at the moment and whether or not you should look at it. Um, yeah, so that's why at the moment um, I put it in, I put it sort of at the end in like rather than pure architecture, I put it in like a principal ecosystem because I think a lot of us are still working that out. I feel like it's gone through a similar hype cycle to like, for me, the simplest one to map it to in a dev perspective would be microservices. I think that it's going to be useful, but I also think it's like microservices, you can make a lot of messes. Like you could end up with all sorts of data everywhere and no one knows where anything is. And I think that it needs a lot more thought. So looking at how to get your data catalogs, how to get your data like um, 
metadata, how to search for the different stuff uh, is going to be really important because it could get lost really, really easily. Um, I think we're in early days and I think it's going to take a few years to see you know, who, who wins and who fails in making some of those mistakes. And I think also think that it can enable us to release stuff a lot more often. Um, but yeah, it, I think it still needs to be tried lightly. Does that answer your question? Yep, anyone else? All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming. It's been really awesome to come to Sydney and I've caught up with heaps of people. I've actually caught up with lots of Brisbane people in Sydney. Um, and I'll be around for the rest of the conference, which is not very long now. And have a great day.